Good evening and welcome to our uh, first Cafe Politique of the 2014-2015 season. My name is Robert Ermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. To find out more about our institute and what we do, I invite you to take a look at the handbills on your chair tonight and visit our website at mipr.ca. Tonight, in partnership with the Joseph Zucan Memorial Association, we'll be discussing the challenges of accountability and transparency in municipal government. Accountable, accountability and transparency matter to Councillor Zucan throughout his civic career, and it remains a challenge today. We've all been witness to a news media filled with stories of apparent breaches in accountability and transparency, not just in municipal government, but in provincial and federal government as well. What can politicians do to rebuild trust? What are some of the mechanisms to encourage greater accountability and transparency? What are the actions that can ensure a culture of transparency and accountability within municipal government? These are some of the questions that our panel and all of us will be thinking about tonight. Our moderator this evening is Mary Agnes Welch. Mary Agnes is the public policy reporter for the Winnipeg Free Press. Her detailed biography, as well as those of our panelists, are also found in your welcome papers. <coughs> Following tonight's event, I invite you to fill out your feedback form. Many of our events come from your ideas. I'll pass the mic now to Neil Cohen to welcome you on behalf of the Joseph Zucan Memorial Association. Enjoy. Thank you. Can you hear me with the mic? Is that? John? It's not very good. Not very well. So I'll use the mic then. Um, so as I look across this room, I, I see, I know many of you, and uh, know that many of you uh, knew Joe and uh, knew of Joe, and those who knew Joe. Uh, probably you, Joe, better than me, so I'm not going to talk a lot about Joe, but I'll talk about the idea for this event and, and very briefly about the association itself. Um, the association, uh, Joe Zucan Memorial Association and Trust Fund, was established in 1986, shortly following uh, Joe Zucan's passing, and was really created in order to uh, recognize and honor Joe Zucan and the legacy of Joe Zucan. Uh, donations were obtained and uh, the fund was established and funds held with the Winnipeg Foundation were a, a very small trust fund. Uh, but we've, since 1986, we've actually uh, made over $100,000 in grants to various nonprofit organizations and charities that carry on work and activities that are consistent with the uh, ideals and values of Joe Zukin. Uh, we also award the Joe Zukin Citizen Activist Award almost on, a, on an annual basis and recently uh, we held an event with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives at the West End Cultural Center in which the award was presented to Shirley Lord. Uh, for more information on the association and the trust fund, uh, you have copies of your brochures that I'll refer you to. Um, we thought we wanted to hold an event this year, but we didn't want to use it as a forum for other mayoralty candidates because uh, apart from the dog catchers, I'm sure that every organization uh, has some kind of mayoralty forum in which many of the same candidates appear over and over again. So we thought we didn't we didn't want to take that route, and, and we didn't want to provide a forum either for uh, candidates and politicians to be able to speak. But we reflected on you know political life not just in the city of Winnipeg but throughout Canada, and we talked about some of the values that, uh, in our view, were very strongly associated with Joe Zucan, but are sadly absent uh, in, in much of uh, political life today, the values of accountability and transparency. And certainly when we look at what's happening within the city of Winnipeg in recent years, uh, you know, we thought that would strike a chord with some people who were demanding that there be more transparency and accountability at City Hall. That was certainly some of the issues that uh, we faced in recent years. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to remember the legacy of Joe Zucan and those things that he represented. Um, and also to put together a panel and hear from our panelists on those particular themes in recognition of Joe Zuck. Um Just in closing, I do want to thank uh, our co-sponsors for this evening. Uh, in addition to the Joe Zucan Memorial Association and Trust Fund, uh, we also have uh, the Manitoba Institute of Policy Research housed at the University of Manitoba, the Association of uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, of Canadian Ukrainians, is that correct? Yeah. United, United Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Thank you, Victor. And we have Uchpo, which is the United Jewish People's Order, also co-sponsoring this event. Have I left anyone out? Thank you for your co-sponsorship, and we want to thank McNally as well for playing such a vital uh, and important role in the local community. This is a great opportunity. It's a great venue, and we're pleased that so many of you were able to join us tonight. So, thank you very much. <clears throat> <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Mary Agnes Welch and I'm your hostess for the evening. Um, so, uh, just before I introduce uh, our panelists, I just want to tell you briefly about how the evening will go. We've got sort of three talks by our folks here and then I'll ask some questions and if I have stupid questions, you folks can ask questions. So we're hoping to get plenty of um, a, a participation from the audience tonight. Um, I will say to start with that I never covered an election, I don't think, but I've covered a lot, that where accountability and transparency have actually been election issues. Typically these are just journalist issues or just die-hard city hall or government watcher issues. But this election we're talking about how tendering is done and, and uh, how EPC uh, ought to be formed and open data and uh, campaign expenses that ought to be uh, much more public than they are. And we have never seen that before. Typically it's crime and infrastructure, healthcare and something else. There's, these are always the top issues in any kind of election and this time it's openness and transparency. So this, this event is, is perfectly timed. Um, and these folks are also perfectly um, uh, poised to tell you uh, their views on this topic. I'll start with Muriel Smith, the legendary Muriel Smith. Uh, Longtime NDP activist and feminist. You all have uh, her bio in front of you so I won't read it uh, verbatim. I will just mention that she was uh, president of the NDP. She ran for the leadership. Uh, she was uh, uh, elected uh, in 1981 and immediately uh, 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 appointed to cabinet. Uh, she was the first female deputy premier in Canada. She was the minister of like pretty much everything provincially. Uh, economic development, community services, corrections, housing, labor, status of women, everything but finance practically it seems like. Um, and after she uh, lost to Reg Alcock in 88, she continued her work internationally and locally, where she taught <coughs> science, uh, social work um, uh, locally. So when she's, she's, in my time in Manitoba, her name often still comes up as kind of a legendary um, uh, activist in the party. Uh, next, over to the also legendary, uh, Bill Neville. Um, he's best known, I think, uh, especially in this part of the, of the city as the longtime counselor for Tuxedo. Uh, he served for 10 years, mostly in the 1980s. Um, and he's best known to me as a political commentator and a, a, a Winnipeg Free Press um, uh, writer. And he's someone that I've gone to frequently in the past for uh, sort of advice and, and uh, um, opinions on the state of politics in Manitoba. And next, last, uh, Royce Coop. Uh, too young to be legendary. I think you're actually younger than me, technically. So wait, he'll be legendary soon. <laughs> he is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Political Science at the U of M. He's also kind of our go-to guy on uh, liberal politics. He's written extensively about liberal politics, both in Manitoba and uh, nationally. Um, he's someone that uh, we've started talking to a lot lately, I think, in the free press. Yeah, more and more, which is great. So, um, who is starting? Bill, you're starting. So go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much. As I look around this audience, I see at least half a dozen people who ought to be sitting here rather than me, and uh, half a dozen is probably stating it modestly. But I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm pleased to, uh, to have been asked to, uh, to speak tonight, uh, both as to uh, my connection with Joe, but also because of uh, things related to him and things for which he, he stood. He and I first became acquainted in the 1970s uh, when I was a citizen member of the Public Library Board. Uh, he was the member of city council who had been appointed by council to be their representative on the board at the time. Um, it was a very ineffective body, and I remember thinking a number of times that it was really a waste of, of Joe's time. But as a board, we were at that stage trying to make certain changes, one of which was to give the board some autonomy, um, uh, as uh, was the case in other cities that, that we had canvassed. Uh, after years of extensive study and consultation, we proposed to uh, City Council that give us certain limited powers. Uh, we canvassed most of the council. Everyone was for it, but when, we, when it came to council night and our board was sitting in the gallery and they were sitting in their seats, every council present voted against us except Joe. Um, the, the issue was one that, in a sense, fueled uh, my willingness to run for council a year later. Uh, once on council, I served briefly on that board. It was not a highly prized uh, appointment, uh, you, you understand. You either had to be a reader or eccentric or perhaps both 
to want to serve as the council representative on it because, as I say, it was relatively powerless. Uh, nice folks, we had a pleasant time. Um, but Joe was for that period, or for part of that period, the council nominee to serve um, on the board. Uh, I was going to say that anyone on that board had to be both a reader and eccentric, and I guess both he and I qualified, although in somewhat different respects. Um, but it was through that shared membership on the board that I first came to, to know him and, and to appreciate his intelligence and his passion. Parenthetically, I, I, I want to note that he had some background, and I'm sure there are many others here who know this part of his history better than I, but he had some background as a, as a young man in Jewish theater. And I mention this because he possessed certain obvious skills um, as, as, a, as an orator and, and indeed as an actor. Uh, which is not to suggest um, uh, that uh, he was doing that just to attract attention, but he knew how to get attention and he knew how to send the English language into battle. Uh, as a politician, he was, I thought, above all else, a man who gave voice uh, to the needs and concerns of those who had no voice. Recent immigrants, the poor, the marginalized, all of those who stood as it were, stranded beyond the gate. Uh, I think those concerns and those connections always colored his responses to issues and to circumstances. And I, I, I only recently became aware of, a, of a, an episode that really illustrates that. I recently had uh, breakfast with Nick Dakin, who was for 10 years the uh, uh, chief commissioner of the board of commissioners of the city. And I, I wanted, among other things, to talk to him about well, some of the issues before council, but also some of his recollections of Joe. And he, he told me an interesting story. He said, um, and, I, and I remember this happening, that uh, Nick's salary was raised to $50,000, um, and Joe voted against it. Uh, what I didn't know was that after the vote, Joe sought Nick out and said to him, you know, I, I think it's an important job and worth the 50000 and I think you're the man to do it and worth the 50000 um, But understand that a great many of my constituents can't even comprehend the notion of a $50,000 salary, and it would boggle their minds to know that I had voted for it. Um, and, and I think that was, in, in a way, characteristic. I mean, he, he, he was realistic on the one side about what the situation demanded, but he was also, he, the, the other reality uh, was the state condition and expectations of the people that he represented and expected uh, him to speak for them. From, from my perspective, there were two things about that period that differ, obviously, from, or markedly from the present. First, the council was much larger, 29 wards, uh, necess necess necessarily, therefore, smaller population. And one consequence of that, I think, was that a man like Joe could get elected. I'm not sure that in wards the size we now face, uh, that uh, Joe, even if he came back, uh, could get elected. Maybe not even in the area that he, that he once, once represented. Um, and I think that was one of the advantages of the smaller council, even if it, it, it had the side effect that you got, every once in a while there were a few people who were elected that you wondered how, in God's name, it happened, how, how they even knew enough about council to want to be on it. Um, but the, the, my experience was that in, in overall, the, the councillors were more diverse in, in outlook, experience, and circumstance, some full-time, some part-time. The demographic, I think, was rather different from today when, uh, when basic salaries for councillors today, I think, begin at $85,000 a year. I think when I retired, it was something like 22. Uh, I mean, that's a long time ago and allowing for inflation, but. Uh, I think that, that is the low salary. I think the, the senior members of the council who have other duties probably make $125,000, $130,000 a year. And um, it, it's, a, it's an entirely different world, and I'm not entirely convinced that it's a better world for that. Uh, I think one might still want to make the case for a smaller council uh, paying them more than we got, but less than, than is being made now. The more important point of substance, I think, that needs to be inter interjected here, though, is that the operation of council, which prevailed during the time that I was there, and for much of the time Joe was there, he'd been there much longer, 
which is to say from the early 1970s to the mid-90s, were facilitated by a board of commissioners uh, which headed and directed the civic bureaucracy and was, in my experience and in my opinion, an invaluable resource to the council. I was not always enthusiastic about some of the individual things that came out of our dealings with them. But in, with perspective, uh, I think they were very able people, and I think uh, on balance, we were very lucky to have them. And the commissioners were both proactive and reactive. They raised issues, they prepared reports for all the standing committees, particularly reacted, responding to recommendations from the Executive Policy Committee, which consisted of the mayor, uh, the chairs of all the standing committees, and I think two additional ones elected by council. As between the politicians and the bureaucrats, it was in the main collegial. It was also clear that for all the skills and knowledge reflected in the board, the buck stopped with the Executive Policy Committee, and the Chief Commissioner knew that and accepted that. Um, the commissioners oversaw the activities of all civic departments and, and agencies and reported through uh, the appropriate subcommittees of council. Uh, usually their recommendations were unanimous, but not always, and I think I took that as a, as a positive sign in and of itself. Um, one didn't always have to feel one always had to agree with the recommendations from the board. Nick Dakey and I crossed swords several times, in fact, but you always felt confident that they had done their homework and could provide rationales for the policy recommendations they were making. And I think for most of us who were part-time counselors, that level of assurance was uh, a sine qua non of, of our functioning. That is, we, we had to rely uh, on the intelligence, skill, and, and uh, knowledge uh, of the people who were advising us. Subsequent events, it seems to me, suggest that that balance has been seriously upset uh, two factor, two developments that seems to me are relevant. One, the, the decision to reduce council by half <coughs> seems to me that one of the results is the councils now might represent much larger constituents necessarily um, with the large salaries I alluded to before. I think under this regime, people like Joe will find it very difficult uh, to, uh, to get elected. And um, I think the I think the, the result is that there are fewer advocates, and this may be ignorant to my but my sense is that there are fewer advocates uh, on, city, uh, on city council these days um, for a particularly disadvantaged group. Now, I may be doing them a, a, a great injustice, but so far as I can follow what goes on in the papers, uh, that is my sense. Secondly, the thing to, to, uh, that I would mention is that the Board of Commissioners was abolished during Susan Thompson's tenure as mayor. It has been suggested to me that the board was condescending to Mayor Thompson, which, if so, I think was unfortunate and inappropriate, and if it had that result, uh, counterproductive. And I, but I'm going to say that as someone who, as some of you will know, was highly critical of, um, of her agenda. Um, but I, I say I've heard this from several people who knew the inside story, that uh, she was not treated respectfully by some of the members of the, the board of commission, and, um, she got a, uh, a consultant who would come and tell her why some other structure was appropriate. He came and he did just that. The board was replaced by, as, as you will all know, by a senior administrative officer who proved to have very wide powers. Uh, the extent may be best illustrated by merely mentioning the name of Phil Schiegel, who resigned from the position in 2013. Um, and I'm coming to the end, my colleagues will have it here. Um, in, in the controversy over the refurbishing of the old post office and in what might be called the case of the misplaced fire hall, uh, we were given rather graphic illustrations, it seems to me, uh, of the dangers inherent in the concentration of power in any one pair of hands. I don't believe such a thing would have been possible uh, in the earlier period, both because of the the greater number of councillors who would have been looking at it, and also because of the structure of the bureaucratic side. That is, those recommendations would have had to come through a board. They would have been defended if defensible in four different standing committees, plus the executive policy committee. That council consisted of 29 members. Uh, some, some of you may have been struck as I am by the coincidence that there are 29 members of perhaps 30 MLAs um, in our system. Uh, 
And most of them are silent. I mean, unless they're in, 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 the, in the cabinet. Um, but I, I, I'm, my, my bigger, or larger point in mentioning that is that um, we don't regard uh, the fact that circumstances necessitate having that many MLAs. It's partly because you have to represent the rural members, and they have much area, larger areas to to, uh, to, uh, to deal with. But there was a kind of built-in assumption, I think, that you couldn't have a, a functioning, effective political body with, with 29 members on, on City Hall. Um, and it seems to me that there is no absolute and clear correlation between the numbers in a legislative body and that body's capacity to do its job. City Hall has direct and primary jurisdiction in all sorts of matters, ranging from essential services, like fire, police, to public transit, garbage removal, streets and traffic, water, waste, zoning, property assessment, permits and licensing. Uh, one might argue, indeed, that these are the services with the greatest impact on people directly and daily. There's something principal about this, it seems to me, that it is regarded as a junior level of, of government, but that it is responsible for that range of responsibilities with their implications. So given this, um, I think, and I have no idea what Joseph would do on this, but I can guess, that given this, moving to a smaller council, as was done, and vesting great power in one person, as was done, might strike one as counterintuitive. But such are the vagaries of political life, or so it seems to me. Thank you.